And we're on. Yeah, we're on, yeah. And today's guest, we've got Chris Lambriano. First yeah. of all, Chris. How you do, James? Yeah, really well, thanks. I just want to thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Um, you've had a very interesting life. You did life in prison. You were involved with the craze. And, but you've changed your life. You, you turned to Christ. And now you're doing good things. You're trying to help others knock down the same route you did. So, how's things? They're good. I mean, I'm, you know... I look back on the last kind of 35 years or even more that I've been out of prison. I went away when I was 29, so I've had more years out of prison than I did before I went in. Mm -hmm. And there have been good years. I've seen children being born. I've been there when they've entered the world. I've picked them up and held them. The disappointment of a child going, being undernourished because of twins. Ironically, I went away for twins. <laughs> Spent 15 years in prison. And then come out and you had twins. Had twins. You understand <laughs> what I'm saying? And uh, a boy and a girl, mm -hmm. and they've made me so proud because my daughter. I went and saw her when she got her degree, and uh, she's got a lovely job now. She's happy, married, and everything else in a proper way. But for an East End kid like me to actually see your daughter getting a degree with a mortar ball and gown and all the rest of it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. As a blessing. It, it blows you away. Yeah. And I've got three daughters. Three of my daughters have got degrees. And they've all got good jobs. And so I'm kind of, I'm blessed. Yeah. You know, it's a son of mine, he's a barber, and a good one at that. Mm -hmm. uh, and my other son, he works for, he's a, works in office. So, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, only one of them got into trouble. He's one of these kids, you could send him across the road here, but he across it there. Mm -hmm. But he learnt his lesson. Yeah. You know, he needed a, sh a, sp a spelling inside to pull him together. Yeah. And so, it's clean, you understand yeah. what I mean? And sometimes that happens. Sometimes it takes a bit of misery or a jail sentence to change your life. It doesn't happen for the majority of people who do go inside, but your prime example yourself, you get charged with murder with the craze, you came out and changed your life. But we'll go right back to the start, Chris. Um, yeah. Where you brought, where you get brought up? I was brought up in several places. I mean, originally... Um, I was born in Camden Town, um, and then the, uh, the bombing started the war. I was born in 1938, and which makes me 80 years of age. God, how am I 80 years of age? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I never thought I'd see. You 20. look great for 80, by the way. God, oh. <laughs> so you do. Still kicking about, man, which is great. Well, they say read, learn, and inwardly digest. <laughs> <laughs> and try and do the right thing. Keep busy. Uh -huh. Do something. Always have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. Put a smile on your face or put it on somebody else's face. You reach out to somebody. It gives you, you, you draw life from that. Mm -hmm. You draw strength from that, seeing somebody else get up off the pavement and march on. Yeah. And, so and how, was your, how was your upbringing then, Chris, as a young lad? My mum was a firm Catholic, and that's how I was brought up very much in a Catholic faith. But we moved from one area to another, to another. I mean, I came home from school one day and the roof had collapsed where the bomb had uh, disturbed the building and what have you. So then we had to move to a workhouse over in South London. That was from West London. From West London, from the workhouse, after being there for seven months, they moved us to a halfway house in Victoria. We were there for six months and then they gave us a flat in the East End. Well, you know, it's the thing I can still remember. There's a lot of racism about at the time and just having a foreign name, you know, meant you was never going to have an easy time. Mm -hmm. And I just remember going to a party, being invited to a party and uh, this lady turned me, I said, leave the Greek kid out, he ain't coming in. Uh, and, you know, I mean, I, 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 I weren't Greek. I was English. I'd gone to English schools. I spoke English. I didn't speak Greek. I didn't speak anything else. My dad tried to get me to read it, but I thought, what do I need it for? I'm in England. Mm -hmm. I didn't see myself going anywhere else. So, you know, being kind of an outcast, I mixed with the outcast kids and started bunking off at of school and things like that. Um... And my dad found out, he blew his nut over it because he was a straight man. I said to my dad, what do you want to be, Dad? Come on. What do you want to do? He said, 
I want to be a decent citizen. And that was his philosophy in life. Yeah, I never hear anybody turn around and say that anymore. I want to be a decent citizen. And when I thought about it, he was everything a decent citizen would be. Because when I was in prison for, for 15 years, mm -hmm. he never let me down. He was there every other week. Yeah. But not only for me, for my brother Tony and my brother Nicky. Because it wasn't two of us went away for the crazy thing. Three of us did. Because they wanted to wipe the family out. We chose to be with the craze. We chose to be with the craze because we had no cho no choice. The craze didn't make no threats or anything else like that to us to stay quiet. The fact was they was already nicked. If we'd have chose to go the other way, we could have gone the other way quite easy. But we didn't. I'll tell you what happened. I had been part of a... a how can I put it? <clears throat> part of a group, part of a, 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 a system. Through schools, Borstal, detention centre, prison, part of a philosophy. You don't rat on your mates and they don't do it to you. There were many times I did things and people never dropped me in it. And I certainly wouldn't have dropped anybody in it whether it was the smallest guy on the block or the biggest, they were the same to me. And that's what kept our mouth shut. You never got in the dock and pointed your finger at anybody. That, that was the philosophy of the underworld. <clears throat> I never put myself in any position today that I would have to do that. Do, do, do you follow what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I yeah. don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to break the philosophy. Yeah. I can stay true to myself. Yeah. But things have changed now. Is there's no respect anymore. There's no, no there isn't. for anybody. But back in the day, there was a more respectable. But the people. thing was, we started out. It's <clears throat> now every kid who's naughty has got a uh, different kind of name you can give it and everything else like that. It's labelled. They didn't do it with us. They just lung us in, in institutions. How did you think the institutions were when you were younger, going to Boston, going to prisons? Do you think it made you worse? It made you rebellious against that no, life, torture? It, it, it gave you no hope of a straight life. Mm -hmm. You were there with other people who were the same. They came from everywhere in England. We never, ever got chucked out of anywhere. We were made welcome because our friends were there. The friends we'd done, Borstal, detention centre, prison, approved school, they were all over the country. Yeah. What kind of crimes were you doing at the start in your early uh, teens? And start of uh, nicking lead, uh, that's what I got approved school for. Uh, breaking and entering, um, I got done for, I got a Borstal for. Um, and then um, I, I did uh, safe blowing, um, I got prison for. Uh, long firm fraud, you name it. I got to meet everybody, <laughs> and because I was sound, mm -hmm. I could move up a, 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 a mm. level any time. Because people trusted you. People trusted me. Yeah, mm -hmm. we got a bit of work down here. Right, Chris, you want to? We need somebody to come with us, a driver, or you're out on the pavement doing a wage snatch and stuff like that. So it was violent. It was what we did. We didn't beat anybody up, mm -hmm. you know, severely. They were always going to recover from whatever we did. And maybe you can't justify it. And maybe it was wrong. But that I didn't see myself ever any, any opportunity. In, in my world, you could either be a footballer, a boxer, or a criminal. That was my world, Jamie. Mm -hmm. So in East London, you become a product to your environment where you think it's normal? No, I did think that, yeah. yeah. How did that affect your dad, though, being a working-class man, trying to be the perfect citizen? Did you... My dad had his own community. Yeah. He mixed with his own people. People from, from Cyprus. From Cyprus, Cyprus yeah. And, and Greeks and everywhere else. But anybody was welcome into it. Black, Italian, German, French. Everybody was welcome into their world mm -hmm. and treated equally because they all felt to some degree that they'd been pushed out. You understand what yeah. I mean? Now it's a different world. 
you've got a foreign name. Everybody's got a foreign name. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a foreign relation. Whether you're black, green, yellow, the, the, the first person, there weren't a lot of black people around. But I went over the dog track, at Arrogate dog track. Uh, my dad was going to go and get his money. And a black guy came up and asked him where he, where he got the money for his ticket. And my dad called him brother. I'd never heard anybody call anybody brother. And, and I admired that. You understand what I mean? Now everybody calls each other brother. You understand? How you doing, brother? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you had respect for everybody. He had respect everybody for everybody, yeah. 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 So when did you start getting involved in the serious stuff? The serious stuff. How that came about. Uh, I met people, good people. And uh, I, I was on the run and I finished up in Birmingham. And um, I first of all got to Liverpool. And I, Liverpool wasn't really somewhere where the, I, I saw much opportunity of earning money. And then I dropped down to Birmingham and I got to meet some people down there and um, I got offered a job on the doors. So I was working there on the door. Then other things came along. And uh, so I got to meet quite a few people. And one day a friend of mine, a Jewish guy, Kenny, he had a row with some people and I stepped in and helped him. And uh, we became very good friends. And he had a peer at the Old Bailey. And I went there <coughs> to see the trial. And afterwards, uh, went down to the uh, cells to see him. His mother was down there. And I didn't know what was going to happen. He went, Chris, he said, I want you to take this jewellery. And I went, why? And he said, Pam. And I knew exactly what he wanted me to do was take all his jewellery and give it to his wife or to his girlfriend. And his mother said, what do you want to give him the jewellery for? You know, it, it belongs to the family. He said, no, I want Chris to have it. And I took it when I left there and gave it to his girlfriend who was waiting in a cafe. And so, you know, he introduced me to different people. Then I met other people and so I expanded. Yeah. And um, I then met other top criminals who I don't like to name and uh, got involved with them in different things, long firm fraud, um, which I uh, starting a company up and then doing a runner, mm -hmm. you know, ordering everything from everywhere. <coughs> and you've got solid bank accounts, but all of a sudden the bank accounts are only there mm -hmm. to prepare for the runner. Just setting up businesses, yeah, that's right. ordering lots of stuff and then yeah, closing and, it down. Doing, yeah, closing down. And then from there, um, I got into gambling. And I knew who was running gambling. And it wasn't drinking clubs or anything else that anybody was interested in. It was gambling. It just started off, but there was big money in it. And uh, Birmingham, the car industry had just taken off there in a massive way. So everybody had money, lots of money. And it was twice as good as London, the club scene and everything else. So, I mean, I, I was living off the top and I got to meet all these different people that had problems at their club. I'd go and sort the problem out. And, you know, I'd, I'd be on like, uh, it weren't protection money as such. Mm -hmm. You were just looking after the club and they appreciated what you were doing. And they give you the readies. Did you have a reputation then? Yeah, I did, in your yeah. 20s? Yeah, but I didn't mess about. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? And um, Did you become a professional gambler? I did become a professional and gambler. What yeah. was your, what kind of gambling? Because, uh, well, I'd play uh, cards, poker, I'd do the, the roulette wheels and things like that. And half of it, we could get to the croupiers, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> so you've got like, cheating, basically, you're yeah, setting we could things do up that. with yeah, one? Yeah, we. we uh, we could do all sorts. Fuck, they say the house always wins. Uh, so well. the craze got to hear about me. Mm -hmm. And they said, uh, I'd gone down to meet a guy to buy some American dollars. And he turned around, didn't turn up. So I'm standing at a bus stop because my car's in the garage being repaired. And a guy called Ronnie, Ronnie Bender came by, who I knew. Good guy. 
And he went, Chris, what are you doing now? I said, I'm waiting for a bus. He said, come on, I'll give you a lift. Did he give me a lift home? So I got talking about it. He was an ex-soldier, a regular army and all that kind of thing. Really good guy. And, uh, well, I went home, had a cup of tea, knock on the door. And I went to the door, it's Ronnie Bender. And he said, Chris, he said, uh, the twins want to meet her. I went, Ronnie, do you need a few quid? You can have a few quid, I don't want to meet them. Because they weren't very well liked by the underworld. That's the truth. Because people, when they got older money, they'd read in the paper, somebody had just had it off, snatch, bank robbery or whatever, they'd go straight in and want their corner. So really, they were called these ponces. Taxing people? Yeah, that's right. And people got Adam there. So when I'm saying to Ronnie Bender, I don't want him involved in my world, really. Uh, but he said to me, your brother Tony's down there. I didn't know Tony had got, uh, was on their firm. So, because we lived, I lived in, in Birmingham. I came down every two weeks, saw my dad, and then went back to Birmingham, stayed the night and that. Anyway, Tony uh, went down there and they were polite. I never ever see them get, you know, brutal with anybody or want to hurt anybody. They were always perfect gentlemen. And they said, Chris, we understand, like you're in Birmingham, you've got some stuff going. Wonder if you'd help us out. So I said, how? They said, uh, we're opening the club in Leicester. Um, would you be interested in bring some people over? So I said, yeah, I think I can do that. So I, I went away from there and uh, went to the, uh, what's the name, the, their club, had a, look, had a look around. It was nice, Gav. Started to take people over there, people who spend money. And they were doing rather well. But then Charlie Cray said to me, who I, we were good pals, he said, Chris, he said, don't tell him, he said, but we're getting. He said, because they'll want it before we've even got it. Because they could spend money like water. And that was the way they were. And so anyway, the, the, the fact was that one day we're at a party and Billy Hill's nephew was another good pal of mine, Mickey Riley. They started on Mickey because they thought he, he knew and they were, he was telling me to keep my mouth shut. But he wasn't. It was their own brother was saying to me, Chris, tell them nothing because they'll want it before we got it. So anyway, everything was going well. I, I had a car pitch up there. I had my own car wash. I had all this kind of stuff going on. I, I was earning a lot of money. And um, a mate of mine, Ray Mills, said to me, Chris, he said, uh, I'm going down to London at the weekend. Do you want to come with me? And I said, well, what do you mean, come with you? He said, well, uh, you can meet my brother, Alan, and I'll meet your brother, Tony. And I went, no, I was down there last week. Another time we'd do this, Ray. And he went, please, just let's have this to one time. I thought, oh, come on. I'm always going against your better judgment. Your intuition. I, sh I should have I gone my intuition. But I didn't. I went down there. We met in Limehouse. We went from Limehouse to... Uh, a place called the Marquis of Cornwallis on the Bethnal Green Road. And uh, Mrs. Cray, old Charlie Cray, the twins, Charlie and all them were there. Went in, we had a drink. It was an occasion for the old, old, old lady. It could have been her birthday. So we spent some time there, pay our respects, come out and we go to the Queen's Pub on the Hackney Road. We have a nice drink there. So by this time we're kind of well tanked up. So Tony said to me, look, Chris, let's go to the Regency. I said, look, I don't want to go to the Regency. I want to go to the West End, the best seller, because plenty of birds down there, atmosphere is good, let's go there. And he went, no, let's just go to the Regency. They've never been there, let's show them what it's like. And we went there, and uh, we're having a drink, and Jack the Hat comes up to me, he said, there's a party, he said, are you going? I said, well, it's first I've heard about it. And the next thing I know is I get an invite to this party. So it's got, it must be about half past 12 now. So my car was chocker blocked in. There was no way you could get out. But Jack's car was able to get in his car. We got in his car and we got in the Regency Club. Uh, sorry, 
Erin Road, which is maybe two or three streets away. We'd gone there, gone up to the door. Their cousin, Ronnie Hart, opened the door. And we go in, go down the stairs, and Jack is in front of us. He runs straight into the room. Where's the birds? Where's the party? And then an argument starts. Reggie Kay pulls a shooter out, which he's admitted in his book he did, and it didn't work. I thought it was a frightener. But I didn't like what was going on. Because this shouldn't be happening, you understand what I mean? So I turned around to a guy called Connie Wyatt. I said, Connie, I don't want none of this, I'm going. And he went, Ronnie Cray came out, I said, what's the matter with Chris? He said he wants to go. He wants no part, and Ronnie said, take him home. So Connie Whitehead dropped me off home. I'm sitting there with my dad, I'm having a cup of coffee, and I think Tony's there. And I've always been very careful about Tony. Protective. Protective. From a small baby, you know, up to an adult. So I had a shooter there, 38 Webley, I went and got it, put it in my pocket, and... Uh, Got a taxi down to the Regency, got my car, and went to Everin Road. I went up, knocked to the door, and Ronnie Bender came up. I said, Ron, um, is Tony there? He went, no, Chris, he said, um, he, he's gone. And I went to turn away, and he said, uh, Chris, he said, please, don't leave me. I went, what do you mean, Lee? He said, they've killed him. I said, no, not in front of all them people. He went... He said, he's dead, he's downstairs. I went, Ronnie, I'm, I don't want no part of this. He went, please, he said, don't leave me. And I looked at him and I thought, hey, you're a guy who's been in the army, straight guy. I said, where are they? Where, where's the twins? He said, they've run away. And I thought, they may have run away, but I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to help you. You understand? And I went inside, went downstairs and there was a body laying on the floor. And I thought, you know, when you walk down there, there's no noise or no, anything. I thought he's gonna, he's gonna stand up in a minute, he's gonna be all right. I wanted, it, I wanted him to get back on his feet. Do you understand? I wanted it not to have happened. And I, 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 when it's time I looked at it, you've got to face the reality of what has happened. I went outside and got some socks um, that were in a washing basket in the kitchen, brought them in, I gave Ronnie a pair, I put them on and we began to tidy the place up. So now I'm walking up the stairs and who should come back but a woman called Blonde Carol. And um, she said, uh, hello Chrissy, how are you? I said, uh, I'm all right. I said, you can't go downstairs. I said, there's been a little bit of a, Argy bargy, I said, and we're having a tidy up. But I've got a bucket full of water and blood in my hand, and she saw it. And now I know she saw it because she gave evidence to the fact. So I've already been up to the uh, bedroom previous to that and got an hider down, which is downstairs. We wrapped Jack up in it, went upstairs again because facing the house was a uh, on a side street was a bagel place which is Jewish like roll things and all the cab drivers in them days were Jewish most of them anyway and they were all they're going all through the night so we got to find a place where there's no, no traffic about to get that body out and get it in the boot so finally there's a break and we try to get the body in the boot six foot man you can't get him in the boot so we put him on the back seat then we go back inside, we have a tidy up, and uh, I said to Ronnie Bender, I said, look, Ron, you're going to drive the car. And he went, Chris, I'm not driving that car. Not with that body in. I said, well, do you think Tony's doing it? He ain't. Because Tony, by that time, had come back. Because my, my, he'd gone home and my dad had turned around and told him I'd gone looking for him. Anyway, the thing that happened was Tony stepped forward and said, I'll drive it. I went, Tony, are you crazy? He went, no, I'll drive it. So Ronnie Bender and I got into my car. Tony got into the car with Jack the Hat in, and we followed him uh, down to Mayor Street, but 
going down to Mare Street, a police car dropped him behind Tony. Now, I am now worried that them police are going to stop Tony. And if they do, I, I've got to shoot them. You understand what I'm saying? You've still so, got a gun on you? I've got a gun on me, yeah. So if I say that there's a, 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 a comedy of errors, there's a tragedy of errors. A man goes down to a party, there's 16 people there. They kill him in front of them 16 people. Apparently, because the gun didn't work, his cousin, Ronnie Hart, went and got a knife from the kitchen and put it into his hand. Ronnie Hart went up the old bailey, turned Queen's evidence, didn't do a day, and had a reputation or, or a criminal past as long as anybody else. He was as guilty as Reggie Craig for what he did. Conspiracy? He, he didn't do a day. So anyway, what happened then was he, we, we driving along, they turn off the police and we carry on, we go through the Robber Eye Tunnel, we lose Tony. Driving around, I finally found him outside the church. The car had run out of petrol and or he said so. So on the pavement by the car is confetti, it's everywhere. And um the thing was that uh, I thought he'd be safe. The people would be going to church in the morning. They'd see the body in the car and they'd call the police. And we'd take it out of East London, put it in South London. So they'd think that whatever happened, happened over that side of the water. That was the plan. We leave there. Ronnie Bender goes, drop him off. We don't know what he's going to do. He goes and sees Charlie Cray. Charlie Cray uh, tells the twins... The twins involve somebody else to move the body, and it is a bloody nightmare. That's exactly what happened. So then, you know, we carry on as normal. I go round the Mills brothers and other people and tell them, keep calm, you understand, it's all covered over. Things are going to be okay. Things are going to be okay. We don't know that the firm is crumbling. I was never part of it, but, you know, it was crumbling. They were all backbiting each other and all the rest of it. And so they started nicking people, and they nicked the twins, and they put them in jail. Um, so I know they ain't going to say nothing about me. So I feel fairly confident that me not being associated with them, living in Birmingham, I'm safe. But I think to myself, well, I'm going to go abroad. So I talked to a mate of mine, Johnny Hunt, and Johnny said, yeah, we'll, we'll leave tomorrow. And we were all set to go, but he'd been messing about and his wife got angry and all the rest of it. And uh, he said, Chris, I can't go. Not with her the way she is. So that stranded me. So I went about my business as normal. The police arrested me in Warsaw. I was living in a hotel there and brought me down to London uh, and talked to me, took me to a place called Tintagel House on the embankment. They talked to me, said, we don't want to arrest you. We know you had nothing to do with this. Tell us about it. And I said, I can't tell you that. I don't know what you're talking about. Party? What party? There's never any party. Anyway, give me a, 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 a what's the name? His card, Nipper Reed. And he said, look, there's my number, give me a call and we can sort all this out. Neither you nor any of your family would do any time. I'll give you my word. Anyway, I, I left there. What I did was made a stupid mistake. I thought I'd go and mark Violet's card, the twins' mum. So she'd be up visiting them and she'd tell them what happened. But there's this mother looking at me and saying, please, Chris, don't tell me, go and tell them. Please, I'm asking you. They're my boys. Everybody's deserted them. Please go and talk to them. And it was like listening to my own mum. You know, this was a mother making a plea to me. And I, I, I don't know. I'd let my own mother down so many times. Was I going to let this one down? No. So I'll go to uh, Brixton with her and a girl called Carol, Reggie's girlfriend. And... Um, I saw myself in as Mickey Mouse, 
thinking I'm being clever. Yeah, being funny. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'll go in and Charlie Cray looks at me as if I say, like, Chris, you shouldn't be here. This is the last place you should be. Mm -hmm. But Reggie and Ronnie, yeah, Chris, great to see you. You're looking well, blah, 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 how's things going and all the rest of it. So I said, look, be careful. I've just been to a place called Tintagio House yesterday. They've got photographs of everybody on a the board there, names and people marked off and all the rest of it. There's something very serious going down here. And I've told you, that's the best I can do. Chris, great, thank you very much. Keep storm. I said, don't have to tell me to keep storm. I'll see you later. Anyway, left the visiting room, uh, drove home with uh, Mrs. Cray and uh, what's her name? Dropped them, Carol, dropped them off at Bunhill Road and then went away and was living life as normal. And about two weeks later, the police came up to Birmingham, shoot it up and everything. Took me on the, uh, what's the name, at the elbow room, as I'm coming down the elbow room, and um, brought me back down to London. So I said to uh, one of the coppers, what are you nicking me for? And he went, fucking virgins out of season. Well, that actually happened. I was in the police inspector's house because I knew his son, and him and I had pulled a couple of birds and we'd gone back there, and I thought that's what they were nicking me for. But apparently that was definitely not what they were nicking me for. It was that. So it take me back down to uh, London, Tintagel House, heavily escorted, go in there, and Nipparee turns around and says, uh, right, he said, uh, you was in Brixton a couple of weeks ago, weren't you? What were you doing there? I said, went up to see the twins. After seeing me, I said, yeah. He said, do you want to talk to me? I said, no. I ain't got anything to say to you. I said, there was no party. I don't know what you're talking about. And I, I could see him. He was getting angry. And he was playing with a gun. And he ran round the table and smashed me over the head with it. And I said, yeah, is that, is that what you do? This is a cop as well? Yeah, this is Nipper Reed, the, the, the top man, the top policeman, mm -hmm. who nicks the craze. I know that he wants me to react. And I'm thinking, if I don't react, he ain't got nothing. He's so frustrated, he's banged me with that gun to get a reaction, and I'm not going to give him it. So anyway, I could see him getting angrier and angrier, and he turned around to Inspector Cater, and he went, charge him. And Cater went, charge him? He said, yeah, with murder. He wants to be with the craze. We'll make sure he goes down with the craze. And that's exactly what happened, Jamie. So, listening to that story, it's your loyalty that's got you in that position. That's your right. Your loyalty to your brother, your loyalty to the, the guy, Ronnie, yeah. who was at the door to get rid of the body. Yeah. The loyalty to the craze because yeah. the mum says go up to prison. Yeah. That whole thing, looking back, you must be kicking yourself that... It's, I should have listened to my inner self. Yeah, instead of your loyalty. I, I, I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. It's the work. It's the. It wasn't the craze. They were already out of the way. You mm -hmm. understand what I mean? I could have done. So said, why did they charge you? With the, did they charge you to try and to get you to turn queens? Because they've already got them. That's right. Because there's so many people turn because queens. The, yeah, but the people they had were, were problematic. They were so involved in the murder. Mm -hmm. I was the only one. I was one of them that weren't involved in the murder. So if you never went back. Your brother wasn't there anyway. No. Your brother went back to look for you. Yeah, that's right. Why did you or Ronnie not just leave the house and not and just leave the body? Well, with Blonde Carol upstairs with two children. Was she in the house? She came back. Remember I told you yeah, about with a bucket yeah, of yeah, blood? Yeah. And she gave evidence mm -hmm. that she saw me with a bucket yeah. of blood. So after when you got told that you were charged with murder, how was your feeling then? My feelings were... Well, they've got no evidence. The people who've actually uh, actually given evidence will have nothing. Who, who are they going to get to turn against the Crays? I couldn't believe anybody would. Did the Crays try to put it on anybody to take the blame? No. I'll give, give them that. They never did that. Although rumour had it, they did it with Big, Al, uh, big uh, Albert Donoghue and people like that. But no. It it never never occurred to me that that would be something that would happen in. So anyway, 
we finish up at Bow Street Magistrates Court. And I think I'm the only one there. But then I heard somebody speaking and calling out Tony. And I recognised the voice as Ronnie Bender's. So they've got Tony, they've got Ronnie Bender and me. That's not just coincidence. They have got something firm which puts us all in certain places. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? So whoever they've got is somebody who was there that night. And my first thoughts are the two young guys who are there. It's probably them who, who said what they've seen and everything else like that. I never expect, you know, it's our water. So anyway, we, we get... We stand up and then I look at, in the dock and all of a sudden I see Freddie Foreman. I'd never met him before. I thought, what's he doing here? Well, apparently he was the one that the twins told there's a dead body on your manor. And they brought him in to move it, which he's admitted in his books and everything else. So it's, it's a total catastrophe. You've got two guys... One doesn't take his medication, apparently, and the other one's deeply in grief and is on speed and everything else and drink. And an argument starts and it escalates to about involving 16 people, getting people involved from here, from there to here, running out on Ronnie Bender. Freddie Foreman is now involved. Their brother Charlie's involved. You want to tell me these guys were top gangsters? You couldn't make it up. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's just not. I'm telling you this story. What what's your thoughts? Yeah, I'm just thinking that because people as people really that tough if they turn queens, as people really that tough if they can't face reality and, and be a man and admit what they've done. Nobody wants to admit what they've done, of course, but the whole ripple effect of it, of that situation, first of all, somebody's lost their life. Second of all, it's the people involved. It's also going to affect yourself, yeah. your father, your yeah. brothers. My wife. Your wife. My baby. Yeah. So how long were you involved with the craze for, before this incident? For less than, I'd say, maybe 12 months. Mm -hmm. And it totally transformed your life? Yeah. Yeah. You had a great life in Birmingham, obviously you were doing I had crime. everything going. Yeah, but you are doing the gambling scene. Yeah. How were you doing the gambling? How were you winning your money? Well, because I told you, we actually... Uh, we we had the crew pairs on our side. Yeah, you know, so they could win and relate. Doing yeah, that that's stuff. right. You could win. Professionals. On yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously the craze got wind of that. They wanted a piece of the pie. Yeah, that's they right. Contacted yeah, you. That's so right. anyone who was making money. Yeah, the craze went to them. Yeah, that's right. And they never try and put it on you and say. No, they never put it on you. They invited you in because they were all glitz and glam as well. That's right. The name yeah. was so big, people would have wanted it anyway. Yeah, that's right. But you didn't? I didn't want it, no. You wanted involved because of your worried yeah. of your brother? Yeah, that's right. So obviously when the case... So, and, and it didn't hurt me to do him a good turn. Yeah. You understand what I mean? They'd appreciated me doing them a good turn mm -hmm. by bringing people over to the gambling club. They were going to earn money out of it. Because, listen, on any gambling table, there's a little slot in the middle. It all finishes down there anyway. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. They take a percentage of each mm -hmm. game. So they never lose. And that's where the money was. The money wasn't in people standing around drinking, pulling birds and being social. The money was in the gambling. Yeah. You know, yeah. and they knew that. And gambling had just taken off in this country. Mm -hmm. So it, it was like the old Wild West, really. Yeah. It's, it's, a wild, it's a wild story, but the day you got sentenced... No, so now... We go and we we have to make to go to the old Bailey. Uh -huh. Are you thinking you're going to get away with it? I, I think I'm going to get away with it. I do think that, but it doesn't make any difference. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to get in that dock and point my finger at anybody. Tony's not going to do it, and Ronnie Bender's not going to do it. We're not that kind of men. You understand? There's no what deals I mean? put in the table for no. people to admit. Other people getting off. Was there a concern that... The, the, the deals had been put on the table by Nipper Reed prior to us, or what's the name in? Or we could have sent a message to him, look, we're interested in doing a deal. We never spoke to him. Because mm -hmm. you thought you were getting off? We thought, no, it wasn't. It, it, it just didn't... 
there was it didn't matter what happened we were not going to point the finger at anybody jamie mm -hmm. you understand what yeah. i mean it wasn't what we did ronnie bender didn't do it tony didn't do it and i didn't do it mm -hmm. we never got in the dock and point our finger and said yeah. you know this that and the other because a lot of people did turn queens how many yeah. people turned queens uh, well a whole lot literally the whole gang you understand me? Yeah. They're, they're most of their firm, who'd been with them a long time, mm -hmm. they gave excuses. One was that he was meant he had to take the Mitchell murder. Another one that he had to take the Cornell murder uh, and all that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, there's no excuses for that, especially in a life of crime. Yeah. And that's for anybody watching or listening. That goes to show you that the biggest and strongest firm in the UK at yeah. that point they all turned against each other. That's right. And that yeah. shows you the, the, the calibre and mentality of people but they you're just, looking up to. But they just wanted to get out. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Mm. They hadn't come up the way we'd come up. I had come up through proof school, borstal, detention, prison and everything else. I could walk in any institution and I'd know somebody there. I, I didn't see myself... Crime was what I knew. Crime was what I did. That's all you know. You understand what yeah. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No matter what it was, I was going to be involved until I got enough to get out. How close were you as well to having enough money to get out before? In Birmingham, Jack I could have seen myself maybe in about four or five years being quite a rich person. Where were you going to go to? Spain? I, I would Cyprus. like to have been like a mate of mine, Johnny Hunt, mm -hmm. who had a place called the Ponderosa. And I took uh, Charlie Cray over there, Mickey Riley. They couldn't get their head, head around it. You could land a helicopter on the roof. Where was that, Spain? Uh, no, up in near where, they, where the train robbers and all the cars and all that went for mm -hmm. sale. There's a, a big car place there, auction. And it was quite near there. It was in the country. Oh, was and, it in the UK? Yeah, in the UK. But then I'd also want to go to Cyprus because mm -hmm. my dad kept telling me about my beautiful country. And I said, Dad, if it was so beautiful, what are you doing over here? <laughs> but the trouble is you couldn't earn any money over there. Yeah. So they came to England. You understand what I mean? Mm. Not to benefits. There were no benefits. They come to earn a living. In what they knew, they were chefs. They were workers. When, when London was being bombed, they sent mm -hmm. us out of London. And we went to a place called Ibstock. And my father was working uh, for the RAF, uh, fixing planes and things like that. And I actually went and sat in Spitfires and, and stuff like that. It, you know, wonderful. But then we moved back down to London again. So, you know, I mean, there was a lot of upheaval in my, in my life. Yeah. I mean, I was robbing trains when I was nine. <laughs> with other kids there'd be trains with stuff in the in the sidings mm -hmm. and we'd get in there and you'd find everything from cigarettes to mm -hmm. everything you know what I mean yeah it so was, at that life for a very young age involved in a life of crime even no matter no matter what crime it is something will always come back and bite you in the ass that's right yeah so even the Jack the Hat murder you never did it but yeah it's just the whole the whole effect of your life is yeah, going right. to eventually, that's something's right. going to come on top. So what was it like, the old Bailey? What was the procedure then? The procedure was, we'd all been charged with murder. There was an argument made that I had committed no murder and therefore should not be charged with murder. I should be charged with accessory after the facts. Tony didn't take no part in the murder. Ronnie Bender didn't take no part in the murder. All the main perpetrators was the Craze and their cousin. Do, do you understand? Yeah. And none of the other people, the Mills brothers and all him. And the Mills brothers turned, ever, turned Q, QE. But how can I put it? They were two guys, totally innocent, went out for a drink, and there's a murder takes place. Come on, you understand what I'm saying? I understood it. I understood it. But... The thing was, how can I put it? They, so many people could have got badly hurt, could have got majorly hurt. And so when they stood up in the dock, 
I could understand them. I didn't like what they were doing, but it wasn't them that killed us. Do you know the person that killed us? What they did, they put two murder trials together. It's so unjust. They should have been, we should have been tried separately. You go out uh, with Ronnie Cray to a pub and a guy gets killed in there. Ronnie Cray shoots him in the head, George Cornell. I don't know you. I never even knew you at the time. I didn't even know the craze at the time. You don't know me. And um, I go to a party and a man dies. You don't know all the people here sitting in the dock. You weren't part of it or anything else like that. Just like we weren't part of yours. But they joined the two murder trials together. So by hook or by crook, they were going down. Yeah. You understand? There should have been two murder trials. They joined the two and they got a girl who had denied uh, a statement and everything else like that and made a false statement. She got in the dock at the old bailey. She was the barmaid at the blind beggar when Ronnie Cray shot George Cornell. It was like listening to an angel speak. You could not doubt one word she was saying. She was very believable. It was coming from her deepest inside, the things she was saying. And I knew then, at that moment, we were fucked. Yeah. So how, being so high profile, why shoot a man broad daylight in a pub? Why kill a man at a party with loads of people? Was that the calibre, was that the route they were going just... Went ruthless and didn't care. They didn't care. It was only a matter of time. But they didn't care about their people either. So why should their people have cared about them? Was everyone they getting used who were involved with the case? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think Freddie Foreman says at some stage that uh, there was a plan going round to do them in. Because they went too wild? They went too wild. And it could affect poss- yeah. possibly... And that night when I got the gun... And I went back to that house. I went back there with murder in my mind. Because if they'd have hurt Tony. Do you think going back to that party yeah, where Jack the Ham yeah, murdered? Yeah. And you getting that gun, you could have potentially killed the craze? Yeah, I could have done, yeah. It just, I just, I would have had to do it. He's my brother, you understand what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I would have had to do it, Jamie. Where does your loyalty come from then, Chris? Your loyalty to willing to kill another man for your family, willing to stand trial, not point fingers. Where does that come from? That came from my background. Just came through the system? Through the racism. Mm -hmm. Brings you tighter in. Do you not understand a lot of the black kids and all that kind of kids from all over the place, why they get together? Because they're not rejected by each other. Mm-hmm. There's a fierce bond of loyalty. And they die for each other. Yeah, because it's all they've got. They've all, all they've got. Yeah. So when you get caught... When I you... want to belong. That's all I ever really wanted to do was to belong. Mm-hmm. If, if, the, if, if, if I'd have been accepted into that party and they hadn't left the Greek kid outside, I might have entered another world. Do you think you maybe abandonment issues there where you wanted someone yeah. to love you and show and, you acceptance? And then I had a girlfriend, Patsy Emmons, who came and visited me in, in a proof school and everything else. I loved her to pieces. I did. I bought her little gifts. I wanted to marry her and to be happy forever. But her mum and dad said no. She lived uh, next door to the Shay family. Um, and I... I you know, it broke me up, mm-hmm. the rejection. Yeah. And she turned around and said, my mum and dad said, I can't see you anymore. Do you think that was a catalyst for you just to go fuck Part it? of it. Yeah. Part of it. There's a, there's a whole many chapters to people's... Yeah, that's right. That, Psychological yeah, stuff. Yeah, the trauma and the pain. It, yeah. has, a, it has a whole roller coaster effect. And then, so many different things. And then when you go into prison, Jamie, you've got this vast sentence of 15 years, which is unjust. 
But then you think about all the bad stuff you've done in your life. And you think, well, I'm paying for that. On this trial, I should have been doing 10 years. Do you, do you follow what I'm yeah. saying? For accessory after the fact. Mm -hmm. I should never have been done for murder, but I was guilty as hell of accessory after the fact. I helped to move the body. I helped to clear the flat. I didn't have to, but I did. Yeah, so you're still part of it, but you were willing to accept that? I'll accept that. Mm -hmm. So the first part of my sentence, I'm doing time for that. You understand what mm -hmm. I mean? I'm doing time for things that only I know I've done. Which I'm happily to admit. Which I'm happy to admit. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? So uh, uh, you know, I hold my hand up to it, mm -hmm. and that's my time. Yeah. I didn't deserve to do 15 years. I didn't deserve to have murder wrapped around my neck because mm -hmm. I'd never intended to murder anyone apart from one person. Um, and it didn't happen. He was lucky with four bullets in him, he survived. Mm -hmm. And he said to Tony... Uh, he went to the Regency Club and he said, um, Tony, can I have a word with you? And uh, Tony said, uh, why? He said, uh, because there's something I want to show you. And Tony showed out to some people and he, they went downstairs to the toilet, went in there and the guy lifted his shirt up. He said, do you know what they are? And Tony went, yeah, they're bullet wounds, aren't they? said, your brother did that to me. He said, you're bloody lucky, ain't you? So, <laughs> <laughs> Who was this? This guy. Anyway, the thing was, the guy turned around and said, I deserved it, I took a liberty. Well, I went to a certain place uh, with a girlfriend of mine, and he was there. And he'd come running out with a firm, and I weren't expecting, had a knife up to my throat. And he was quite capable of, of putting it in there. And he said to me, don't come round here ever again. Stay away, she's with me. He said, because if you come round here, you're going to get this. And I thought, well, don't provoke him or anything else like that. Keep it calm. I said, well, I'm not arguing with you over your girlfriend, uh, which was my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. But... I'm not arguing with you over your girlfriend. You told me that. Just wanted to and do it. Yeah, I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm getting out of it slowly, and I finally, I'll go. With a word like, don't come back. He made a big mistake. He went to my house where my wife and my child was and started asking questions about where I was and all the rest of it. I thought, I can't take this anymore. He's gone round my house, and that's a threat. Mm -hmm. He's threatening my family. That's like a warning kind so of thing. So I went over, got the 38 out. I went over there and the firm come running out the door. Got a big night. He said, I told you. I said, yeah, I'm telling you now. Boom, boom. And they all died for cover. Ran inside the house. And I just, I ran out of bullets. Many oh, bullets is in the gun? Pun, there Many. were six. Mm -hmm. Two I fired off and four went into him. Uh, and that was it. You know, yeah. So see, when you got your your 15 stretch, how was your feelings towards the craze then? My feeling towards the craze, I thought they'd have helped us out. Gone, you know, these guys didn't do nothing. You understand mm. what I'm saying? They didn't turn queens. Nah, nothing. Nothing. They didn't. They didn't do nothing. But they put us in in jail with Ronnie. I was in jail with Ronnie Cray up in Durham Ewing with a few of the faces, and the appeal was coming up. So I said, Ronnie, I said, give us help on this appeal. No, 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 he said, we can't, you know. I said, Ronnie, you've got to help us on appeal. I said, we've stood in a dock with you for the longest trial in criminal history. You're not getting out. They are not going to let you out. Well, we, we can do this. I said, you couldn't do it then. How are you going to do it now? Mm -hmm. so yeah there was a bit of anger there a bit on this so obviously going through all your lives through robberies murder trials yeah. shooting people yeah you turned to Christ no I didn't you didn't turn you, you said before Se seven years yeah seven years I was in jail uh -huh. 
you've got to be in there to understand it. Mm -hmm. And you look at the people you've hurt. I'm going to ask you a dead straight question. You've got a wife out there and you've got a young baby, 18 months old. You called her Angela because you, she reminded you of an angel. Angel. You've got what you want or part of what you want and you throw it all away for what, two lunatics? What would you have done? Yeah. Why are you going through court at the time? You've got to just accept it, face the time, and then try and get out. Do you know what I mean? Jamie, you've got a wife out there. Mm -hmm. You've got a child out there. You've got a life out there. What would you have done? If I was at court and if I could turn queens, I would have done the sentence. You'd have done the sentence? Yeah. There ain't that many who would. Yeah. There ain't that many who would. Mm -hmm. I sat in a jail and there were people in there called me a lunatic. It's so easy to say you would. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Because you're not in that position. A million percent, yeah. You understand but what I mean? Being involved in that life of crime, no matter, there's always going to something arise. That's and right. Not necessarily you did the crime, but you did other crimes prior to that, which you That's never right. get caught for. So yeah. for me, involved in that, you've got to accept that You've got to be a man. That's right. When you, If you're me, yeah. you do what I did. Yeah. You understand Don't what get me I'm wrong, saying? the temptations is there. If you've got money tucked away, your missus is there with the kid, yeah, yeah. you're thinking, fuck them, I don't owe them nothing. Nothing. They've got me in this situation. Yeah, that's but right. Yeah. Your pride, your respect, your yeah. honesty for your family. So it's not anything about mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've just said, yeah. you know, you don't owe them nothing. Yeah. But it's the greater yeah. The greater good, you understand? Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, for in that life, I understand. It's you not understand. the greater good, you, but Deep inside, it's for you because if you came out, yeah, in your mind, you know you wouldn't. You would have had to live with your head down instead of up. That's right. And money can't yeah. pay can't for buy that, that shit. No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's easy for me sitting here. I've never experienced that. Yeah. In that situation, but, but you understand I it. I totally understand because you've explained it. Yeah. But most people can't get their head around it. Mm -hmm. They think, well, you cared more about them. It was not caring about them. They didn't count. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? It was more pride for yourself. It was more about not pointing the finger at anybody. Mm -hmm. You understand? Standing in that dock mm -hmm. and going, it was it. Yeah, because everything you've done in the past just goes to shit. All your loyalty, right. you all your respect. You wasted everything. Yeah. You understand me? Totally. So that's, that's it. So I'm halfway through the sentence. I'm looking back. I can't find nothing. I'm looking forward. I've got no hope. I'm doing life. I don't know when I'm ever going to get out, if I'm ever going to get out. And this day it came down on me. And this guy down below me was playing this rock, this song on the, what's the name? On a, on a record player, because you could have them in the jail. Yeah. And it was called Knocking on Evan's Door <laughs> by Bob Dylan. Yeah, it's a great song. A great, great mm -hmm. song. Is that not about his... Yeah, Ma, take this gun off yeah. of me, I can't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's getting dark, too dark to see. I'm knocking on Evan's door. You know, and because he'd had enough of the killing, he'd had enough of everything. Mm -hmm. It's life, it didn't see nothing, just darkness. And the rage is coming down on me. My blood is boiling one minute, and I'm cold as ice the next. If a screw walks through that door, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to justify me doing a life sentence. But then something says to me, Chris, you can't think like this. Get your head together. And start thinking sensibly. So I'm, I've got underneath the bed and a good friend of mine from Scotland called Stuart Brown. He always used to say to me, Chris, he said, he heard me talking to this guy one day, he said, you can't teach a pig to play the violin. It won't like you, it won't thank you, and it will probably turn around and attack you. <laughs> and he was dead right. Mm -hmm. You can't teach a pig to play the violin. <laughs> and there's a lot of pigs around, I'll tell yeah, you that there's now. There's fucking plenty of them. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was spot on. Mm -hmm. Stu, he was a great guy. He was a philosopher. He told me things about different places he'd gone. He was into the rave networks and stuff like that. Music, Van Morrison, Pink Floyd. Chris, you've got to listen to this. What's that? Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Mm -hmm. Me, I was like Johnny Ray, 
Frank Sinatra blew my mind. The Dark Side of the Moon is absolutely... Al, uh, what's his name? Um, Al Stewart. The mm-hmm. uh, Year of the Cat. Uh, what's it? Uh, something, uh, all stories about life that were very poignant and very much gripped you. You understand Doesn't what I mean? Words. About generals sending men to die mm-hmm. and they sat in the back and mm-hmm. took the credit. You understand how wonderful yeah. they were. What about the man who died in the trench? Wasn't he like me, left a wife and children? What about money? It's corrupt. It buys everything. Everything. There's bigger thieves in Parliament. Mm -hmm. There's bigger killers in Parliament. And I'm telling you the truth, there is. They send people to war. Do they care how many people die? Everything has a repercussion. Mm -hmm. The ripples go out and it affects so many people. It affects generations of children. It affects wives. It affects fathers, mothers. Yeah. Uncles, aunts. Yeah, definitely. James is a fuck up. Yeah. You understand what it's I mean? It's an illusion, yeah. It's, to, to it's a total the illusion. People. Yeah, yeah. Why, when did you start looking into all that then? From So this night it starts. Yeah. Before that, I'd, I'd kind of read stuff. I'd gone through comparative religions and everything else, Sufism, which Stuart told me a lot about. So before the seven years, how was your respect in the prison? Obviously being involved with the craze, not sticking anyone in. Yeah. You must have had a lot of respect. Yeah, we did. You, yeah, you did. Did the screws treat you well? They treated me because well. Because I know the beatings were bad But I then. messed up. And what I did, um, in Albany Prison, they sent me there. And they, they took everything off us. And we were treated like normal prisoners. And we're, we're doing fantastic big time. And I became very good friends with a guy called Freddie Sanson. His, uh, his cousin was uh, Terry Sanson, who played for Arsenal. But he was the gamest man I've ever met. And one night down there, the doors were banging down the block because him and I had got chucked down the block over the screws were beating him up and I jumped in and knelt him. And they carried me down the block. They didn't do nothing to me. Uh, but in the morning... Uh, Freddie came out of his cell and threw a b- bucket of piss over him and they really beat him up. And then there was another guy called Ray Powell next to him and he did the same. And I thought, I'm the last one on the block. What do I do here? Yeah. You know, I can stay behind the door and keep out of this or I'm going to do the same as what they have done. Mm-hmm. You know what I did. Tell me what I did. You went out? Your loyalty? <laughs> threw the pot of piss over him got bloody uh-huh. battered mm-hmm. uh, really battered uh-huh. believe me uh-huh. um, and I'm still fighting and everything else I'm black and blue mm-hmm. and um, the next morning I got up to the window and uh, Ray Powell was there and I said Ray you alright and he went yeah and I, you could put your mirror out the window and you could see if he had a mirror, the next cell. I look, I say, Ray, you've had a hell of a battering, son. Mm-hmm. He said, have you seen yourself? And I hadn't looked in the mirror. I didn't want to. I knew what I looked like, which was shocking. So next morning, the screw comes around, chief, and he goes, get to your feet. He said, the governor's here. I said, bollocks, send them in and finish it off. Really, that's how I felt, Jamie. Yeah. You can't do anything. Let more, you can't do anything less than you've already done. Mm-hmm. Come on, finish it off. And uh, the governor came in and he went, my God, what's happened here? I said, you know what's happened here. He said, no, I don't. He said, but you're going straight to Parkhurst Hospital where you can be taken care of. And uh, they got an ambulance round. But I insisted upon walking to the ambulance because I didn't want the screws thinking that, you know, they'd, they'd have me over. And I walked by every one of them screws and battered and covered in piss and shit. I'm walking and I'm looking at every one of them as I'm walking by, thinking, you know, I had nothing to lose if they did me again. So Was what? that breaking point for you then? Just your willing That was to part die? of it. Mm-hmm. Then I go to the hospital and uh, the Queen's surgeon was a part time doctor uh, at Parkhurst Hospital, where he lived on the Isle of Wight. And uh, he came in and he went, well, he said, I think you've lost the sight in that eye. I've got two massive black eyes. I think your jaw's broken. I kicked my teeth in. 
and that. Anyway, I was over in Parkhurst for around about three weeks and then sent me back to Albany and I saw one of the screws that did hit me and I ran after him and he ran inside, locked the door and within an hour I was out of there. I was up at Hull, sending me, sent me up to Hull. So, you know, that, that was part of, of life. But that night, when it all come crashing down, Stuart Brown, before he left, he gave me a box of books and I was looking for all the books and uh, I found a Bible. And we were chucked it away. What I wore a Bible for. Mm. I've never read one. The only time I've had one is if I ripped a page out to roll a cigarette in because <laughs> it's like very thin paper. Yeah, a bit as if honest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's what I've done it for. Mm-hmm. But anyway, <laughs> I was slinging all these books everywhere and finally I went, no, I was just nothing going to do it here. End it. And then I picked the Bible up. And I thought, great people have read this book and have climbed mountains and done gr- wonderful things. They've died for it. They've got burnt at the stake and everything else. I've been crucified all for a book. Do you think that resonated with you as well? Yeah, I do, yeah. Being and burned at the stake and yeah. let down. People yeah, turn every, against everything. You. And I picked the book up and I tried to read some of Genesis where it starts off and it didn't do nothing so I put it under my pillow it's now about four o'clock in the morning and I thought well if some of them thoughts can go into my head maybe I can get over this Uh, it wasn't doing nothing so I got the book and I put it there and I fell asleep and I knew I'd found something very very precious and I never let go of it I read it. I went to London Bible College in prison. I did the Bible College Mm -hmm. course. I did all that and learned an awful lot because there's something in there for everybody. You understand, if you read the book of Proverbs, it's like a father talking to his son and giving advice. Them kids that haven't got a father, read the book of Proverbs. Mm -hmm. You have got a father and he's giving you advice. And if you take it, your life will be successful. You won't look at failure, you look at positivity. And there's a book that stood the test of thousands of years and still stands strong. There are people standing on it and I stood on it and it got me through. So that was a turning point. Were you at suicide at that point? I was. At that time, I was, I was ready to go. I, 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 I had to beat the system. I couldn't let the system beat me. And I was about to end it. That was going to be the end of it. And uh, I got over that night and... So see, when you were going through that transition and that change, obviously your loyalties lie with everybody else round about you. You concentrate on everybody else's life, try to help everybody else, but it's a case of, fuck everybody else, it's time to help me. Did you become more selfish towards yourself and realise you need to help you? It was a gradual process. Yeah. I didn't look at anybody else, I was looking at me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go out, so I went in. And I was getting rid of shit I didn't need. You understand what I mean? Yeah. But I'd carried around for years, prejudices and all the rest of it. And then what happened was I looked out the window one day and I was great in the cell. My head would be on the Bible, I'd be on my knees, clean towel out, you know, with a book there. And, you know, it was a place of worship in my own space. Because it's not about church. The church is in your heart. It's not the church. It's a belief. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's a belief. But I looked out the window this day and I saw all these guys going to church and I thought they've got the courage of their conviction. They've got guts to actually go into that church and worship. Mm-hmm. I haven't got that. Were well, you concerned that so, being yeah, surrounded with all the biggest yeah, criminals yeah, in the that's UK, right, yeah. how they were going to betray you? That's right. So I started to play the percentage game. Jesus, you can have uh, 10%. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I'm cool with 10%. But then I thought, well, I want a bit more, so I'll give you 20%. In this cell, my time is yours. Out there, I've got to be on on my watch. Uh, He said, okay, then 20%. And then 30%. And at 30%, I looked out the window and saw these guys going to church. And there was one guy there called Bulletproof Jack. And I looked at Bulletproof and I went, he's got some guts there, man. Anyway, I went up to him and I said, listen, Jack, I said, tell me something. Did I see you going to church? 
He said, yeah. I said, why? And he looked me right in the eyes, he said, because I believe. And walked away. I'd never seen so much conviction in my life. <laughs> it's just like that, I believe. Uh -huh. And walked away. Mm -hmm. So a few days went by and I got talking to him again. I said, what made you believe, Jack? He said, I'd been shot several times and I was laying in the hospital bed and I said, Jesus, if you're out there, bring my father here to me. He said, and I, he was the one man I didn't ever think I'd see again. And what he did, he said, uh, my father came to me. He walked into the hospital bedroom, looked at him and he said, you'll survive. And walked out again. But that's all he wanted. A sign. A sign. And he got it. And that was it. And uh, I met so many other guys there as well, pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. They weren't cruising religion to get out of prison. They just found something in there. Yeah. The quiet time, the solitude, locked up in a cell. You can only read so many books Oops. about porno or <laughs> gangsterism yeah. and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's what they find. Yeah. It's what they find. And you, you never see them in prison again. Mm -hmm. The ones that play the game, they go back. They don't stay out 35 years. Yeah. You understand? And I think that's a great point to touch on that. Listen, change is scary. Yeah. But anybody can do it. And it's to, I always believe and always say the loudest men are the weakest. If yeah. you actually sit down with criminals and break them all down, you realise that they are vulnerable. Yeah, they, they are. are sensitive. Yeah. That is just a shield. That is their protection. Yeah. Because they're so fragile, they don't want to be hurt. Yeah. But it shows that no matter what you go through in life, no matter if you're through some of the darkest and deepest shit, you can find something within. You can find redemption. Yeah. And let you understand? Go. Yeah, definitely. And you can find satisfaction and hope. Mm -hmm. Hope is the main thing. I mean, I, I look at this place here. Mm -hmm. I worked here. I stood in courts like the old Bailey where I was sentenced and I've pleaded with somebody, a judge, to give them a chance. Mm -hmm. And they've gone away and deliberated and come back yeah. and said, We've heard what you've said mm -hmm. and we're in agreement with you mm -hmm. that if this person goes back to the lake community instead of prison, there's hope that his life might change. Yeah. We're prepared to give him that chance. Thank you very much. That's a judge saying that to yeah. me. One, and, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't listen to me in that building at one time. I had my own car parking space down there. <laughs> Your own bed? Yeah, didn't yeah. have a bed, but I had yeah. my own car parking <laughs> space because London was so expensive. Mm -hmm. So I got in touch with a probation service who arranged for me to have a, a what's the name down there? Car park. Car park, because mm -hmm. otherwise I'd be bringing people late to court. Yeah, but that's a great thing because now you've got the respect and a whole different angle. But not only that, not all the materialism, not cars, money, whatever, helping someone else is the greatest gift. Am I in sitting the world. here in a gangster suit? Mm -hmm. No. No, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here, like I got up this morning to go on a boat ride with my wife. Mm -hmm. And then got a telephone call from you, James. <laughs> I've been pestering you for weeks, Chris. <laughs> and now well, we're here. We've done it. Yeah, and I appreciate that. In this place we're in just now, can you explain what you're doing here? Because Not anymore. I don't do nothing anymore. Nothing at what I do, but what we do, we raise money. Yeah. I get all my old friends, people I knew, um, and we have, uh, they'll do a, a, a thing where they do auctions and, other things. Raise cash. And, uh, but what is this cash. place then we're in just now? This place is called the Lake Immunity. Okay. Long-term rehabilitation mm -hmm. centre. Crack, cocaine, heroin, drink. Mm -hmm. Everything. Uh, everything. But the funds are run running low on this. The, the, the funds have run totally yeah. low. So we'll leave a link for people to check it out and hopefully yeah. people can get involved yeah. because this place has helped save hundreds and hundreds oh, of lives. Oh, the, the lives this place has saved. Yeah. And the people that work here don't work here for money. Mm-hmm. They work here because they're devoted to change. And many um, ex-residents who survived and come through all this and have been brave enough to want to come back yeah, and, help and, others. and help others. I think people who do go to the depths and the darkness of life, when you come out of it, your gift is... You want to, to give something. To, You're gifted. You've yeah, got a gift. You, to lift others up and because you And there's nothing it. like helping yeah. somebody, you know, who... Like they have a day, Yeah. I've gone into Banbury to, to to look for a second-hand shop. 
right? I love second-hand shops. You never know what you're going to find. <laughs> and uh, you go in there, and items are a pound, two, three quid. And I used to say to the kids here, I used to take them to the second-hand shops. Why do you want to design a shirt? You're going to pay. Somebody's already tried it on before you. So it's second-hand. Come with me. I'll take you to where you can buy your designer clothes, and you're going to be paying three or four quid. And they loved it because, you know, when you ain't got bundles of money, mm -hmm. you make do with the best you can. So anyway, I, 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 I went along to this second-hand shop, and I've gone to the pound shop, and there's a guy laying on the floor playing a guitar. Uh, and I went in, and I bought a pack of a ginster pies for a pound. I bought two bottles of lemonade for a pound. I bought some, a sandwich for a pound. And I put it all in a carrier bag, and I went up, and I gave it to him. And he snatched it out of my hand. And I'd bought one gin to pie for myself. And he had that as well. And I said, hold on, that's mine. I said, all yours is in the bag. You've got one in the bag. And the look of thank you that he gave me, it was only a, a five quid gesture. It weren't the end of the world. It yeah. didn't break me. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the look of thanks, he didn't want beer. He didn't want any films. He just wanted something to eat. You could look in his face and see that. Mm -hmm. But I had such a good feeling after that. And I'm not telling you this to make me, I'm the big I am, I'm yeah. a charitable man. No, there's always somebody, a kind word, mm -hmm. a lift up when somebody's on the floor. You understand? Yeah. Buy yeah. somebody a, a little present. The only time you should look down on someone is yeah. when you're helping Or kids them up. who ain't got nothing at all. Mm -hmm. You can go to a car boot sale and get some toys there for a pound yeah. and give them toys they can play with. Give them a book to read. Mm -hmm. If everything is cheap out there, but we're all so full of it now. Yeah, we're caught up The now. mobile phone, mm -hmm. and we're going along. There could be somebody being murdered next year. Somebody dying of oh, starvation. Oh, you'd be that. Yeah, you, well, I better take a photograph of that. Mm -hmm. That's the world we live in. Yeah, and it's scary. It is scary. When you came out then, Chris, how was your life then? Because you've wrote, you've written three books, which we'll leave the links on the bottom of this yeah. bio for people to yeah. look into anyway. Yeah. Your three books, how was that when you wrote there? Was it bring back a lot of feelings well, and emotions? the first book I wrote uh, was called Meditations of a Lifer. Mm -hmm. And what I did, I gave it to a group called Prison Christian Fellowship. It does sell on eBay for around about 49 to 50 pound because mm -hmm. it's out of print. And um, what happened was I was in uh, a Gartree prison, no, Coldney prison, and... I don't know, something, I was praying and this voice inside my head said, Chris, don't say these prayers, write them down. And every day I wrote a meditation down and during the course of that uh, meditation, about the 25th day, the one person I didn't want to lose ever in my life died, my dad. And I never thought I could ever handle it. But I went out into a garden. Well, I was a gardener, working in the garden at the time on my own. And I looked up at the sky and the trees and I thought, well, Lord, you made the trees. Coming up to autumn, they're all going to be bare. You know, I, I, just, I just know that you're going to do something with my dad. He's not going to die. He's going to be like that tree. He's going to bear fruit again. And it's bore fruit in my life. I'm more my dad than I ever was Chris Lombriano, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, went away. And so during the course of his meditations, my dad dies. It helps me get through it. It helps me understand it. It gives me devotion. The Bible gives me a, a, a way to handle it. Mm -hmm. Because God says to Abraham, bring Isaac up the hill, up the mountain. Prepare an altar and a lamb on it. And I want you to sacrifice Abraham and then everything will be right. It, it, it's testing Abraham's faith. So Isaac's laying there and he's got a knife and if God wants him to do it, he'll do it. But God says, no, I don't want you to do that. Isaac, take him off the altar. He doesn't belong there. So I figured if they, if they, we can build a mountain, uh, if there's a, if we can build a mountain, on, uh, sorry, uh, 
an altar on a mountain, I'm going to take my dad up there. Mentally, but in a way physically, because I'm going to carry him up there. You believe that? And I'm going to lay him on that altar, and I'm going to say, I can't deal with this, but I'm going to hand him to you, and I know you can. I know you'll take care of him and love him mm -hmm. and give him the peace he never had down here. He wanted to be a decent citizen, make him a citizen of your, king of your kingdom. Mm -hmm. Did he see a transition of change while he was still He did, alive, yeah. Which is a great thing yeah, then. Yeah, Which would have made him proud. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, but one day he said to me, Jamie, when Chrissy said, you broke my hand. I said, Dad, I'd never, 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 I'd never, I would never break your hand. He said, you're in prison. Tony's in prison. Nicky's in prison. I've got two fingers, my two sons. Leo and uh, Jimmy. They brought Nicky down, you know, because he, he was in, he was involved with the craze as well. So he didn't ever have an easy life after that, after we went down. And that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. It affects so many people's lives. Yeah, and I always talk about it on the show. It's the ripple effect. It just spirals down. I believe the better person you become, yeah. the better person you attract. That's right. Um yeah, it's good. Your second book, what was that, Chris? Uh, the second book was um, Do the Walls Come Down? Mm -hmm. We all build walls around us. Yeah. And we don't let them down. It's a protection for our family, protection for ourselves. And securities. We're one person at home, but another person when we go out on the street, mm -hmm. no matter where we are. So our insecurities build this wall. Yeah. And I felt by sharing what I'd written would bring the walls down. Uh, and then the next book came out. That was the uh, Escape from the Cray Madness. And then the next book was the book, The Cray Madness, which is the one out now. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave all the links in the bios. Yeah. Would you like to finish up on anything, Chris? Yeah, I'll say this. There are years which are fruitful and the years which are barren. I may have had some good times uh, when I was back in the 60s and that. And there were some good times. But seeing children being born, children being born, finding somebody who loves you and you love them, because it isn't about jumping into bed every five minutes or kind of saying I love you. It's about looking in the same direction, finding something to believe in, caring about that other person more than you care about yourself, knowing that's real love. When they take care of you and you take care of them, that's the most beautiful love you'll ever find. Yeah. And if a lucky man finds that, or a lucky woman, they're blessed. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Because a lot of relationships are built on things, on possession. External stuff. They're, they're not built on love. Love's tough. Yeah. Love's strong. You know, you don't break a two-chord system. And to work here at the Lake Community where so many people came and had their lives changed. They, if you can't work with love, a man called Callow Gibran said, better that you sit outside the gates of the temple and beg from those who do. When I came in here every day, I worked with love. Mm -hmm. I worked with strength. I had God's backing. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Didn't matter what I was going to face that day. No matter high court judge, probation, police. I was yeah. in the right place. I could stand up to anybody and hold my head up. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great thing, Chris, the way you've changed and the way you've helped others. Sometimes in life, you might need to go through all the bad stuff, all the pain, all the misery, murder ch charges, prison, the loss of your father, to help you turn, have a turning point where you go, fuck this, enough's enough, and then it changes you. And then what happens is you come out of prison and then you help change others. Sometimes you might be brought on this planet just for that reason. Yeah. You may have saved hundreds and hundreds of lives just because you've sacrificed your own, which is a... a but you a don't know. Thing. I mean, I've gone and... I've, I've given lectures at uh, public schools, Eton, uh, Reeds, Cobham in Surrey, Richard Branson, Geoffrey Archer, their children go there. Um, I've done uh, uh, Oxford, Cambridge. I've done all, everywhere. Churches. It got so... I'll be honest with you, Jamie. It got so that, how can I put it, 
it all became about the craze. Yeah. It was not about change. About you. change. Mm -hmm. They wanted me because of the cray thing. Mm -hmm. They didn't want me because, you, you know. Yeah, you changed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, people but I did get it over to them, mm -hmm. and I've got letters to testimony and all that kind of thing. And at the end of the day, I kind of thought, this isn't even about the craze anymore. It's it's about me, but as a gangster. I want I want the message I would send out there is crime don't pay. If you can help a youngster get out of problems, get him off of drugs or her off of drugs, you're breaking your mum and dad's hearts. Mm -hmm. You're breaking your family's hearts. The ripples are going out. You've got to look at that. You've got to look at the people you damage, the people you crush. They're standing there waiting to jump in and help and do whatever they can. But you've got to go with a humble heart. You can't go because most people who, who are in criminality and drugs and all that, they're pointing the finger at everybody else. They deflect it. Yeah. It's not them who's the problem, it's them. Take responsibility. You understand yeah. what I mean? And part of growing up and part of development at whatever age is about responsibility. Yeah. And you learnt the hard way, but it's yeah. good to see you and coming on it's the worth day, Chris. It, Jamie, isn't it? And coming on, yeah. And coming on and telling your story, Chris. Yeah. You're a good Thanks soul, for brother, and yeah. I appreciate it and all the best for the future. Jamie, it's been a pleasure meeting yeah, you. Yeah, thank friend. you. I appreciate it. No. Cheers.